All right, good morning, everybody. I know that I'm the last speaker before lunch, which makes me uh, an unpopular man and puts me in a dangerous position here. Uh, so I'll do my best to, uh, to move through this quickly, but doing honor to uh, Madame Cohen. All right, so this talk is called She Speaks with Authority, and you'll see why it's called that. Uh, the Religious Standing of Karaite Jewish Women from the Middle Ages through Today. And I want to emphasize the part about the Middle Ages, uh, because a lot of the things you're going to hear today might sound like modern reforms, and they might sound like modern changes. But the point I want to emphasize is that these, these aspects have been a part of the Karaite Jewish tradition for almost a thousand years in many instances. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll get started. As I mentioned, uh, this talk is dedicated to the life and activity of Sheila Cohen. Uh, she was known amongst us as the mouth of the Torah because every week in her 80s, she came to the synagogue and she delivered the Torah portion. And she did it with, with wit, and she did it with love, and she did it with grace, and uh, she did it with knowledge. And it was really, really a beautiful thing. Uh, one of the greatest privileges I ever had was to interview her on behalf of the Karaite Jews of America to start gathering the stories of our community. Um, and actually, assuming technology doesn't fail us, we have a clip of that at the end for everybody. So I hope you enjoy that. Okay, um, any talk about the role of women in Karaite Judaism has to start with our central book, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. And uh, in biblical times, women served as prophets, judges, warriors, and even a moil. And so, the question is, with respect to a woman's involvement in a community from a religious standpoint, is can you measure your decision based against this, these data points, right? So we know that women were prophets, judges, warriors, uh, and moyal. Uh, and I want to make sure you understand, nothing I say today is based on any agenda about what women should or shouldn't do or anything like that. Uh, I just have a Tanakh-based agenda. I want to show you what the biblical sources are and uh, let you decide for yourselves because the whole point of being a Karite is to search the scripture well and determine for yourselves what the, uh, what the right answers are. So I'm going to ask you a quick question here. It's something that's not on the screen. Uh, Ellie mentioned ritual slaughter and uh, a person who slaughters meat is called a shochet, that's a male slaughterer. The question for you is this, can a woman be a ritual slaughterer? Yes. 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 yes, why not? Uh, well, yes, why not? Excellent answer. <laughs> Um, so that's actually, that is actually the Karaite answer is yes, why not, of course. Uh, and in the rabbinic tradition too, a woman can be a ritual slaughterer. But, but in the rabbinic tradition, they have this uh, concept that if, um, if someone hasn't been slaughtering in generations and generations, there's a custom for the women not to do slaughter. So some people in the rabbinic tradition suggest that a woman cannot do slaughter because for generations women have not been doing slaughter. Uh, Karaites don't have this concept, and I'll let you know that there's a, one person in this community who told me that both his father and his mother in Egypt knew how to slaughter. One, two, three, four, five. Grandmother. grandmother. Look, all right, so maybe ten people in, the, in this room alone can tell me that their mother or grandmother or aunt or uncle knew how to slaughter. In Israel, they actually had a female shochet, uh, shochetet. Yeah. They also had a shochetet, and uh, she just passed away. But there are also women who can do this too. So. Uh, in the Karaite tradition, you know, there's no prohibition to be a, to slaughter meats for daily consumption. Um, okay, uh, she speaks with authority. This is where the title of the presentation comes from. In 11th century Spain, it turns out that the Karaites had a female leader. So th this is significant for many reasons. This is long before modernism, right? Nobody can say that this is some uh, product of the 60s <laughs> or some, uh, some love and happiness renewal. This is basically the community said, uh, we, have a we have a woman, they called her Al Mualima, uh, which is Arabic for the teacher. Oh, someone's correct my Arabic? Yes. Say it again. Al Mualema. So my, I promise that's the last Arabic I will speak. <laughs> um, so uh, it means the teacher. And what's interesting is one of the translations for rabbi is teacher. So for whatever reason, this community was de determined that she was going to be their teacher. And it says, according to one historical source, they relied on her for authoritative traditions. So that's where this talk, she speaks with authority, comes from. Now, I'll just note in passing, and we could talk about it later, that if, in truth, Karaites shouldn't rely on anybody. They should always search the scripture. But it's an interesting point that a, uh, a rabbinite named Avram Ibn Daud, who wrote that book over there from the 12th century, reported that the Karaites had a female leader about a thousand years ago. 
Uh, today at the Karai Jews of America, women regularly explain the weekly par parasha, the Torah portion. They're women who serve on the KJA, the Karai Jews of America's board of directors. In Israel, Ellie just mentioned that there's a, a program for 12 individuals to become the next generation of educated communal leaders. Uh, and two of the 12 are women. And one of them is the sister of the uh, head Karaite in charge, the head, uh, the head hacham of the Karaite community. Uh, so there is involvement in Israel as well for, uh, for women as w in, the, in the movement. Okay, women as witnesses. Um, I, I would ask you, is there anything from that first sheet of paper that I showed you what the women's roles were that would preclude them from being a witness in, uh, in the biblical tradition? And the carried answer is no. Uh, a woman's testimony is the same as a man. She can come to a religious court and give testimony the exact same extent as a man. In the rabbinic tradition, the answer is generally no. A woman cannot be a witness. Uh, they have some exceptions, such as uh, when it's something that pertains to the specific knowledge of women, um, or in some other exceptions where a woman can be a witness. Um, and these next two are really subsets of the first one. Uh, a ketubah. In the Kerry tradition, you need 10 witnesses to sign your ketubah, so as, a, uh, as witnesses for your event. Uh, and women count as witnesses. So here's a picture of a ketubah from a wedding in the last year, or maybe just over a year ago. Uh, and you could see down here, there's slots for 10 people to sign, and six of them happen to be women. Um, so it just this shows you that in the Karite tradition, women can be witnesses. Uh, and then in the new moon, um, just as background, Karites still to this day, they go out and they, they look to see when the new moon is, is uh, visible to set their months. And in the Karite tradition, a woman can be a... Woman can be a, uh, a um, a witness for the new moon. Um, and here's a, uh, a, a uh, card I put together for my uh, blog. I run a blog called A Blue Thread, a bluethread.com. And uh, this woman here, that's Kara the Karaite. Uh, and the guy over there, that's Robbie the Rabbinite. Uh, and I put together these cards just to show kind of interesting uh, uh, situations in Karaite and rabbinical Judaism. Uh, but this was put together for a different purpose. But the point here is that here's a woman sighting the moon. And more, most importantly, in the Kerry tradition, you only need one witness, one uh, valid witness to cite the new moon, and a woman can be that valid witness. Um, okay, Kerrites, women and the synagogue. Uh, there's some children here, so we'll keep this as, uh, as uh, G-rated as possible. When a woman is with her nida, <laughs> uh, if you don't know what that is, I'll explain to you later. Uh, she, by Kerry tradition, she doesn't enter the synagogue. Uh, and I'll explain to you why that is. In the rabbinic tradition, a woman uh, can enter the synagogue when she's uh, with her nida. Um, and the, let me explain to you what the general reason for that is. Uh, I should also tell you that a man, if he's had an omission, also cannot enter the synagogue either. So the idea is that the synagogue is a sanctuary and it's a place that's to be kept ritually pure, um, as pure as possible. So that's, that's the reason for the prohibition. Um, and the rabbinic tradition doesn't have that, uh, that, those, that delineation. Okay, so a mechitza. Uh, who knows what a mechitza is? Yeah, what is it? It's a divider between men and women. Yeah, it's a divider between men and women in the synagogue or in the place of worship for people so they're not distracted by each other and separated. Um, the Karaites actually don't have a, require of a requirement of a mechitza. You see here that the men and women pray side by side and not in between each other. Uh, and the reason for that is because the Karaite's prayer is with full prostration so that people of opposite genders aren't uh, bowing down next to each other in front of each other. That's the reason. But there's no requirements for that. In fact, I have pictures, which unfortunately are copies of copies of copies of a newspaper article, that show men and women in the Karaite Jews of America fully prostrating next to each other. So there is no requirement for separation in the uh, Karaite tradition. Uh, Kol Isha. This is uh, a rabbinic tradition. Uh, generally speaking, women, uh, men are not supposed to hear the voice of a woman under certain circumstances. Um, the Karaites don't have this prohibition. And in fact, uh, you didn't see it today because the weekday service is different from the Saturday service, but there are certain portions of the prayer on the Saturday service that members of the congregation read. And they get to read it, and the entire congregation answers the member. Uh, and the women can read those portions of the prayer. They, uh, they do all the time. There's a prayer called the uh, Hakdama, 
which is the preparation or the introduction, and it's something that the Karaites say before the priestly benediction. Now, the Kohen, the, who gives the priestly benediction, is always a man, right? The Kohanim were always men. So in the Karaite tradition, you can actually have a woman give the prayer that precedes the priestly benediction. So you'll go from a woman's voice to a man's voice uh, in the synagogue, and if technology works, we will have a... Uh, We'll have a, a, the end of the Haktamah here for you. So that was uh, the end of this prayer, the Haktamah, and you can hear that you would go straight from that into the priestly benediction. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that the uh, women who are with their nida, they don't enter the, uh, the synagogue. There is a book called Stains of Culture, a uh, professor named Ruth Sofar. She came and interviewed a lot of members of our community, especially the women who came from Egypt, and asked them about their traditions, their customs, uh, how they're trying to maintain their, their uh, rules of ritual purity in a new world. Um, and it's a, to me, I read it as a Karaite, and it's a very bittersweet for me to read because this is a community that left Egypt and had such strong customs, and you could see the women desperately trying to hold on to them. Uh, and I just think this story here is kind of interesting. <laughs> she records one of the women she interviewed saying, uh, you know, on Yom Kippur, my young son went to the synagogue, and I was not with him. He said, Mom is not here today. It's very personal. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't think that was me, but it sounds like something I might have said <laughs> at some point when I was young. <laughs> All right. Uh, women in ritual purity, uh, we talked about the synagogue. Uh, in the uh, Karaite tradition, a woman is ritually impure from her uh, nida for seven days. In the rabbinic tradition, it's 11 or 12 days. Some communities do something different. But um, the, for the Karaite, the Torah says seven days, so it's only seven days. Uh, during this period, by the way, men and women don't have relations. So this makes a big difference in your home lifestyle. Um, I will say that the uh, uh, Hacham Moshe Farouz was being interviewed by a lot of professors in Israel. And they asked him a question. They said, how long is uh, Nida? And he says, seven days. And someone whispers, huh, like the Torah. And I was like, yes, of course, like the Torah. That's the, <laughs> that's the point. Um, and in the Kerry tradition, we don't have a mikvah. And the reason for that is twofold. One is textually, we don't believe that uh, a mikvah is required. The words that the Torah uses, we believe, very clearly say that you should wash yourself with living water, so any running water is fine. Um, so a mikvah that doesn't have enough of a flow of clean water and exiting the old water is, uh, is, uh, doesn't fulfill these requirements. And also, uh, related to the last point, if the purpose of the mikvah is to purify you and the water stays there, the next person who gets in gets into the impure water. So for men and women, we don't have the concept of a mikvah in the Karaite tradition. Uh, a shower is fine. If you ever wanted to do away with the ritual of purity, a shower is fine. You can jump in a river. Uh, anything like that works. Okay, uh, this issue about the uh, men and women and the ritual of purity and the difference of times is a big issue in the Middle Ages. Uh, and Maimonides actually was concerned about this. Uh, and the author of this book is Abraham Joshua Heschel. He's one of the most Who famous... Mentioned. Yeah, whom you just mentioned. He's one of the most famous... Uh, rabbis in America, and he's talking about what Maimonides is trying to do uh, because of this ritual uh, purity issue. It says, uh, uh, Maimonides now attacked assimilation. Above, above all, the women under the influence of the sect of Karaites who tended more and more to disregard the Talmudic rites of cleanliness. So in his day, this rabbinic rabbi is telling you that there are women in his day that were, um, that were following the biblical tradition, the Karaite tradition, and this was concerning to him. Okay, uh, divorce. This is a, uh, a, a long, long, long topic. <laughs> uh, but in the news these days, you've seen uh, there's an arrest in either New York, New Jersey, several months back where some rabbis were arrested for abducting men and torturing them uh, to force them to give their wives a divorce. And the reason for that is that uh, in the rabbinic tradition, uh, the man must willingly sign a divorce document for the woman to be divorced and to be able to marry somebody else. And in their tradition, they uh, define willingly sign as you're allowed to use coercion uh, to make that happen. Uh, you can discuss this with the rabbi if you want to understand their basis. 
Uh, there's no doubt that historically the Karaites also contemplated whether or not uh, coercion was possible. But since the 11th century, as early as the 11th century, maybe even earlier, uh, the Karaites Beit Din decided that it could issue a divorce uh, in place of the man. So if the man doesn't sign it, sign a divorce document, the Karaites Beit Din can do it. There's some requirements for this. Uh, one of the requirements is that the man is not fulfilling his marital obligations. So for example, if he's gone and lived with another woman uh, and he's not supporting his wife or doing the things that husband's supposed to do, uh, they can, um, the Karaites Beit Din can actually issue the divorce instead of the man. So we don't have this issue of torture. Uh, and one of the things I'll tell you is um, the problem with the story I mentioned earlier about the rabbis is they were charging the women like $100,000 or $60,000 uh, to go and obtain you know, the willing consent of the husband to, uh, uh, to get the divorce. Uh, one of the reasons why the Karaites allowed the Beit Din to break the contract or break the ketubah is because the terms of the Karait ketubah stress the reciprocity of the marriage and present the woman as an equal partner in it. So if the woman is not getting what she bargained for out of the marriage, the Karait Beit Din can step in and say, okay, this marriage is not a marriage anymore. We're going to break the ketubah. We're going to break the contract and we're going to, uh, uh, we're going to give her a sefer kritut, as it's called in the Bible. Uh, okay. Uh, there's actually a marriage crisis in Egypt. Some of the older generation will know about this. And uh, what was going on is this. In between 1898 and 1936, the uh, bridal dowry in Egypt was skyrocketing. The bridal dowry was what the woman's family paid the man's family at the time of marriage. Now, what's funny about this, is, first of all, something like this happened in many, many, many Jewish communities, not just the Karaites and not just Egypt. Uh, but what's funny about this is that the Torah very clearly says that the man is supposed to pay uh, the money, exactly, right? And so I hear people saying that's true. <laughs> so why is the woman paying? Uh, we'll talk about this some other time, but generally uh, the men weren't getting married. They thought their economic prospects in Egypt were low. So the bride's family, who were not spending money in education, right? The women weren't getting educated traditionally. Uh, they uh, were saving the money and using it as a payment to start off the marriage. That's basically what happened. Well, in 1945, there's an, there's, uh, an article in uh, Il Kalim magazine, uh, which is the Egyptian Karaites periodical. And the article is called Five Minutes with Five Young Women. And uh, he here are the names of the women. They were all given their uh, first initial and last name, but we were able to figure out who one was. Uh, I should say credit goes to uh, Catherine Halls. She's the person who introduced me to this. She, uh, this information comes from her... Uh, uh, her uh, master's papers or dissertation submitted. Uh, one of the women was Rose Tawil. She was with our community for a long time. Uh, she married Murad al Kotsi, who wrote The Karaite Jews of Egypt. Uh, and then these other women, M. Masuda A. Kotsi, N. Suleiman, R. Lisha. Uh, these are some of the things that they were talking about. They said this is what they were asked. These are their impressions of the, uh, of the dowry system. I, sh I should back up for one second. The, the women were asked three questions What can women do to raise the standing of the Karaites movement? Two, what do they think of the dowry system? And three, what, um, what do they look for in a husband? Um, by the way, for the Karaites here, one of the things they said they look for is someone who doesn't gamble. So, <laughs> yes, it's very funny because <laughs> it's impossible in this community. <laughs> so anyway, the three question, first two questions were, uh, uh, what, do they th what can women do to raise the status of the Karaite movement? And what, uh, what do they think of the dowry system? Well. The women said, the problem is that the men have become greedy. They're asking questions like, how much money does the woman have for me to marry her? Um, you know, it's the pounds that talk, they were saying. Well, some women said, look, we need, a fema we need female run organizations. We need women that are in charge of organizations within the Karaite movement in order for us to have our place. Otherwise, our place in the movement is going to be limited to teaching about needlework and uh, sewing. It's basically what they were saying. Very different from the 12th century Spain, right? Or 11th century Spain, where Al Mualima is leading a community. These women feel they've taken a step backwards. Uh, and finally, we talked about the, uh, the, it's the man who's supposed to pay the bride price. Uh, and one of the women, Arlisha, she said that this system, system contravenes religion, right? Why is the woman paying money? And she said that the fathers should go on strike from paying the bride price until the men uphold their religious obligations and they themselves pay the uh, pay the, the bride price. Uh, this woman down here, Yusuf, uh, oh, sorry, Esther Tanani, she wrote in an article in Al-Kalim, also the Karaite publication, give us back our dignity. 
saying, look, you know, let's end this system. This is ridiculous. We want a place in the modern Karaites movement. Uh, and she fears that the sect is done for. And that's really what her concern was, that how far the sect had fallen with respect to its treatment of women. Um, this is the picture of al Kalim in 1950. I think it was the sixth year anniversary of the magazine. Uh, the, the caricature there, if I, I, my, I, I said I wasn't going to speak Arabic anymore, I'm sorry. But this guy's name is Abu Yaoub, which is uh, Jacob's father. Jacob's father, yes. Uh, and uh, that's a caricature of an Egyptian Jew. And basically it's saying, you know, God willing, another hundred years. Well, Tanani, the same woman we just talked about, she wrote uh, another article called The Women's Uprising in the Sect. And she's like, look, let's reclaim our rights. Let's have an active place in the future of our movement. Let's be, again become uh, a part of the, the future of the Karaite movement. Uh, and, you know, I, I reported to you how in Israel there are females who slaughter, how they have women who are becoming the... Uh, the next generation of leaders, and here we have women as well who are leaders. So to some extent, her voice has been heard. But one of the things I want to say today, and this is my only agenda I have, is that any movement for it to survive, it needs clearly defined involvement from men and women. It needs involvement from men and women. So if you're a Karaite Jewish woman or a woman interested in Karaite Judaism and you want to learn more and you want to get involved, uh, shoot me a note or come see me afterwards and I'll, I'll help you find ways to be involved. Okay. I mentioned to you that my, uh, my, uh, one of the greatest honors was interviewing uh, Madame Cohen. She's, I believe, 94 years old here. Uh, and uh, she talks about her life in Egypt, and she talks about her, uh, uh, her memories. And this is actually the last minute of what she had to say. So I asked her, do you have a message to the future? Do you have anything you want to say to the future? So what she said there at the end is, I think, I hope I did something today, right? So hopefully she gave me something to show the future. And uh, I can say, you know, she absolutely did, and uh, her legacy will live on forever. And I want to thank her family for allowing uh, us to do this presentation today on the 30-day closing of her morning. Uh, thank you very much. Up to the last minute. Uh, up to the last minute she had her mind. That's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you.